Uh, now it's time for member statements. The, the member from Lanark, Fronick, Lennox, and Addington. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker. Perth, like its Scottish namesake, stands mid spreading fields and fertile lands upon the River Tay. Dense forests once and swamps were seen, whose autumn tints and gorgeous green combined in richer array. Where now the model town is found, with happiness and honour crowned, improving every day. Speaker, it is with great pleasure and fanfare that I beg to inform this House of important news. I have heard reports that a company of Royal Engineers will arrive in Perth on the morrow. This company of Royal Engineers embarked 200 years ago to build a military establishment in the wilderness of Canada West. Their sons, daughters, ancestors, friends and family are all encouraged to greet them tomorrow as we begin a year-long festive celebration of the 200th anniversary of the Perth military settlement. Speaker, it was also 200 years ago that this assembly, in its enduring wisdom, recognized that there was a need to create a legislative library whose purpose would be to serve as an archive for the province, which it would include the many deeds, adventures, and heroism of the colonial families to the Perth military settlement. Speaker, I'm proud to honour the 200th anniversary of the Perth military settlement, and I invite all members of this House to come to Perth, Beckwith, Tay Valley, and Drummond North Elmsley townships and so celebrate this significant historic milestone with us. Speaker, I will be leaving with every haste, and with Godspeed and Providence, I will rendezvous with the company at Rideau Ferry in the morning and add my paddle to their valiant efforts. Now at the close, I wish to say to all the citizens of Perth, may you be prospered every day and long remain on earth. Should war arise or trouble come, may each and all of us be seen most nobly striving to defend our town, our country, and our queen. Thank you. I would entertain unanimous consent to have that as our new uniform, if you want. I mean, it's now time for members. I have to wear one. Uh, member from Nickel Belt. Thank you, Speaker. I rise today to share the comments of outfitters in my riding who are furious with the government's unannounced last change to the bear hunt. After the ministry announced the reopening of the spring bear hunt to out-of-province visitors, outfitters spent their own hard-earned resources and money to rebuild their business. Linda and Jim Loisel from the Watershed Bear Outfitters near Gogamo write, and I quote, Why did the MNRF decide to bring in a quota of non-resident bear hunt permits and wait until three weeks prior to the bear hunt opening to announce that to the outfitters. My non-resident hunters have booked flights and holidays to hunt in my districts. This will cause me to lose $36,000. Appropriate advance notice of changes is only reasonable, and I agree. Trevor Spooner of the French River Bear Outfitters write, myself as well as other outfitters are virtually being put out of business. Gary Stocking and Kimberly Campbell from Thunderstock Outfitters, again near Gogamma, write, the MNRF have proven over and over again they do not understand the management concern of Northern Ontario wildlife. Speaker, businesses need stability and predictability to be successful. The government last-minute changes to out-of-province licenses is hurting my constituents and ruining small businesses throughout North Northern Ontario. There is an interim solution on the table, Speaker. The government needs to act now to save those businesses. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from the Tovico Centre. Speaker, on May 18, 1944, Soviet leader Joseph Stalin forcibly deported 240,000 Crimean Tatars to Central Asia. Over 100,000 of them died. Today, we commemorate the victims of this unspeakable crime. Among those that survived was the legendary Mustafa Jemilev, who is with us here today. He spent decades demanding that his people be allowed to return to their homeland, and as a result, he spent 18 years in the Soviet Gulag. Mr. Jamilev is the recognized leader of the Crimean Tatar National Movement and a member of Parliament of Ukraine, and I am honored that he is here with us today in the legislature as we commemorate the victims of this deportation. Hosh Kaldiniz Mustafa Aga, welcome Mustafa to Queen's Park. 
Two, e two years ago, Speaker, Russia once again invaded Ukraine and invaded Crimea. History is repeating itself. The Russian regime is once again persecuting the Crimean Tatar people. They have closed their mosques, closed their media, and closed their majlis, which is their legislature. The Crimean Tatar people are now facing persecution, disappearances, and execution. Mr. Jamilev's own son has been put in jail, and Mr. Jamilev is now once again banned from returning home. History is repeating itself, Speaker. Just this week, Crimean Tatar singer Jamala represented Ukraine at the Eurovision Song Contest. She performed a song about the 1944 deportation. Jamala moved and inspired millions. Jamala won the Eurovision Song Contest. I am proud that today Ontario was the first jurisdiction, to my knowledge, in the world to officially raise the Crimean Tatar flag in front of its legislature. Why we flag? We fly the flag here today to commemorate the victims of the 1944 deportation. Let us remember and commemorate them, but let us also take this opportunity to learn history's lessons and redouble our efforts to ensure that the Crimean Tatar people can once again live in freedom in Crimea as part of a free, independent Ukraine. Mr. Jamilev, the Crimean Tatar people, and the hundreds of thousands of victims of the 1944 deportation deserve no less. Slava Krimskim Tatarim, Yashasin Kirim Tatarim. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This past weekend marked the 100th anniversary of the 109th Battalion CEF leaving for the battlefields of World War I. Lady Eaton presented colours to the men from Victoria and Halliburton counties, the first time a woman presented battalion colours. The 109th Battalion was raised by local MP Sir Sam Hughes as part of the Buddies and Chums recruitment drive. So many recruits came from the small areas around our region to serve King and Country. Uh, I want to honour the men from all the areas, but the north section, the deep platoons who came from Halliburton, Minden, Goodrum, Harcourt, uh, Highland Grove, Torrey Hill, and my hometown of Kimmount, where my grandfather Scott was Private uh, Wallace Scott and was uh, proudly served overseas. They joined the platoon from the south in Victoria County. Small towns like Argyle, Woodville, Omimi, Lindsay, they too often, I think, we think of things of these events as only about soldiers, battles, and casualties, but World War I was a total war on the home front as well, where everyone was part of the effort. Groups raised funds for soldiers, comforts and, and benefit. They bought victory bronze, planted victory gardens, and wrote letters to keep up morale. Women and children replaced men as workers on farms and in factories. Nurses volunteered, children did fundraisers. Every group contributed so many ways. The Great War is one that we will always remember, not just because of the self-sacrifice to defend the values of freedom and justice, but because it brought communities together. And I want to thank the Victoria County Historical Society for reenacting that wave off. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. It's my pleasure to rise today on behalf of my constituents of Windsor West. As I've stated in this chamber time and time again, Windsor is a proud automotive town, and the industry has always enjoyed tremendous community support. This month, the community once again came together to celebrate the successes of our automotive industry and discuss how we can continue to foster growth in this very important sector. In fact, community leaders from labour, industry and academia held a policy conference on the automotive industry last Tuesday. People living throughout Windsor were encouraged by the level of cooperation and collaboration shown by all participants at the conference. Several common issues were raised throughout the meeting. First, the high cost of energy in Ontario is suffocating businesses and is a major barrier to bringing in new automotive investment. Second, we need to start listening to the frontline workers when discussing automotive policy decisions. And finally, we need the government to identify the automotive sector as a strategic asset. Unfortunately, Speaker, the government just isn't listening. The day after the policy forum, consultations were held in Windsor on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a deal that Unifor President Jerry Dias called outrageous. Nobel Prize-winning economist Joseph Stiglitz called the Trans-Pacific Partnership the worst trade deal ever. The deal will put 20,000 jobs in the auto industry at risk, not to mention the spin-off jobs in the tool and die, automotive parts and technology industries. Even the Provincial Minister of Economic Development admitted that he is concerned about the impact of the TPP on the automotive industry. Speaker, it's time for this government to tell their federal counterparts that the TPP is a bad deal and to finally prioritize the automotive and related Thank industries. You. Member Stevens, the member from Mississauga Streetsville. 
Speaker, it officially becomes summer in Mississauga at the start of the annual Streetsville Bread and Honey Festival on the first weekend of June each year. That is the weekend of June 3rd, 4th, and 5th this year. At the Vic Johnson Community Center on, Streets, on Church Street at adjoining Memorial Park and on the main stage, the 44th annual Bread and Honey Festival features rides, local vendors, great entertainment, games and terrific food, and of course, the traditional bread and honey. Led by our Streetsville Rotarians, many volunteers and groups play host to folks from all across Ontario every year. Our Cat Merlin will join me in the annual Bread and Honey Parade down Streetsville's Queen Street on Saturday morning. On Sunday morning is the traditional Streetsville pancake breakfast. As always, I will be there every minute of both days, much of that time at my booth, meeting our local residents and people from all across Ontario to answer questions about Ontario. It's just $5 per day to get in, $2 on Friday evening. People can get more information on the web at breadandhoney.ca and on Twitter, follow Bread and Honey Fest. See you all at Bread and Honey to get summer underway in beautiful Streetsville, Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Thorn Hill. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I just want to mention that uh, the Jewish community of uh, the Greater Toronto Area has been watching Kathleen Wynne's uh, trip to Israel this week with many members of the Jewish community and business leaders, as well as one Liberal MPP. We're going to work on our side and plan uh, a trip from this side, hopefully soon, to Israel as well. And very soon, everybody knows, I think, in the House that we're going to be debating Bill 202, Standing Up Against Anti-Semitism in Ontario Act, and it's very sad that in the year 2016, we're still talking about anti-Semitism here in the House. Um, I'm just going to quote quickly Kathleen Wynne, who said, I entirely oppose the BDS movement, she said, and imply that it promotes anti-Semitism, and that was just this week um, in Israel that the statement was given. Mr. Speaker, we have in the House today some students from York University and elsewhere who have experienced some of the most horrific accounts of anti-Semitism on campus. And with my experience um, with some of the students, especially from Husbara at York, I've heard first count uh, tales of name-calling, intimidation, marginalization, and violence. Um, I'd like to encourage the members of this assembly to talk to these students after this session, and you can also hear just how terrible the atmosphere is on some of these um, campuses. Students have been barricaded in their uh, club rooms, and the police have even had to be called. So these students need our support, and um, this debate coming up about um, BDS is not about free speech, Mr. Speaker. This is about um, hate speech and intimidation of our students on campus, intimidation of our business leaders and our professors, and intimidation of our brethren in Israel, who I'm sure we all care about deeply. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis, the member from Sudbury. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm truly honoured to rise today in recognition of Jewish Heritage Month in Ontario. Ontario is home to approximately 200,000 Jewish Canadians, a community that, since arriving and making Ontario home, has overcome significant barriers and made significant contributions to the growth and prosperity of our province. In 2012, the month of May was proclaimed as Jewish Heritage Month, with all party support, Mr. Speaker, to honour the significant achievements of Jewish Canadians across Ontario. I also want to acknowledge the uh, member from Eglinton Lawrence and his hard work on um, C-17. Mr. Speaker, May is an important month for the Jewish community in Ontario, including both Holocaust Remembrance Day and Israel's Independence Day, both of which were marked here at Queen's Park. Mr. Speaker, in proclaiming Jewish Heritage Month, the province of Ontario and our government demonstrated our commitment to celebrating the role that Jewish Canadians have played and continue to play in communities across Ontario, demonstrating as well our shared commitment to a strong and productive relationship with the State of Israel. While in Israel this week, Mr. Speaker, our Premier and her delegation are leading an important trade mission, meeting with Israeli leaders and innovators to further strengthen the already robust relationship between Ontario and Israel. And our commitment, Mr. Speaker, is to continue and to work towards educating future ge generations about the inspirational role the Jewish community has played in Ontario and will no doubt continue to play in the future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. For the member statements, the member from Brampton West. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we've all heard about the devastation and loss experienced by the residents of Fort McMurray due to the wildfire and consequent evacuation that occurred. 
It is a tragic it is a tragic experience, and our hearts go out to all those affected. Oftentimes, when tragedy strikes, the silver lining is found in the love and generosity that follows. Especially in Canada, in true Canadian fashion, communities come together to help one another. We share what, whatever we can, from donations of goods to extra manpower, and do whatever is possible to help ease the pain of our neighbours and help them rebuild. Since the incident in Fort McMurray, we have heard of people from all over the country come together to help those affected. Today, I am honoured to share one such story with all of you. This is a story of how ordinary people work together to help hundreds of Fort McMurray evacuees. Joining us in the gallery today is the Sing Khalsa Seva Club. Their members, Gurpreet Singh, Harpreet Singh Bal, Gurmeet Singh, Karnjot Singh Chima, Gurjeet Singh Chima. The day after the wildfire forced Fort McMurray's evacuation, the members of the St. Khalsa Seva Club held an emergency meeting and decided to do something to help. Within two days, each member of the club contributed their personal savings and with additional donations from the Sikh community in the GTA, purchase, purchased essential supplies such as food and medicine and clothing. On Sunday, they loaded about $50,000 worth of supplies in U-Haul trucks and drove pra practically non-stop to the evacuation center in Lac La Biche. I would like to take this opportunity to recognize the St. Khalsa Seva Club for mobilizing and delivering supplies to those affected by the Fort McMurray wildfires. This club also mobilized to help with food, groceries, and blankets for the Knights Table, an organization serving the needs of people dealing with issues of poverty and homelessness in the region of Peel. This is an inspiring story of grit, determination, and teamwork, and a big heart. I am honored that they could make it here today, and I hope this inspires others to give back to their communities and stand by their countrymen in times of need. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank all members for their statements.